Good morning. I can see people are already logging on. Uh, I see that you're here for the seminar. If you're here for the National Referral Mechanism for Victims of Trafficking seminar, uh, you are in the right place. So we're going to wait on until 11 o'clock in a few minutes and then we'll get going. I can see people speaking in the chat. Are people able to hear me? Great. Okay. I got people saying, yeah, that's amazing. This is the first webinar I've ever done. So apologies if it doesn't, uh, if there's some technical issues along the way. Wow, we have people logging on from Kenya. So we're going to get started in a minute. There's still more than 100 people who have registered um, who haven't logged on yet. So we'll have a sort of a slow start and within a few minutes we'll get going. Um, before we get going, what would be very helpful for me is if you can write in the chat what your job titles are, just so I have an idea about who is logged on um, and therefore I can have an idea about who is actually um, we're pitching for, okay. Great. Good, okay, so we got a good array of people so far. And we've got a good array of people from all over the country as well. <clears throat> got some from St. Giles. I've seen a lot of our St. Giles friends have uh, joined on today. So welcome to you guys. Great. Okay. So we've got a few social workers, we've got solicitor, we've got policy officers, um, project workers, St. Giles workers. Good. So there's a good array of people here. Um, because of that, we're not going to be able to pitch to everyone. Um, and so I'll try and cater to everyone, but in the way that some of the stuff that we'll be talking about might not be directly relevant to you. Um, but that's okay. Um, something now is that I'm just going to put into the um, chat, which uh, you can have a little look at if you want before we get going, is 
Um, just my information. So you got my email address. Um, I've just started a professional Twitter account. So if you want to keep up to date with anything to do with child trafficking, it should be on there. And then also our website as well. Great. Okay, I'm going to get going. Um, according to who registered, we're still waiting for more than 100 people, um, which is amazing, by the way. I thought about 10 people would join on to this. Um, so I couldn't believe it when, now that we've got almost 200. Um, but yeah, we're going to get going. Um, and then as people join, we can continue. So <clears throat> welcome today. This is the first of our um, webinars and then and this one's on the national referral mechanism can everyone see the slides Do people see yeah okay great uh some people are saying no right does anyone know why some people can see the slides and some people can't Right, can reconnect option top right is the slide in the background, yes. Okay, so I mean, it's hard for me to know what you can see compared to what I can see. Um, I can't see me at all, so I can see the chat, and but I can't, and I see the slides, and that's the only thing that I can see. Um, don't worry if you can't see me, you don't need to see me. Um, but the most important thing would be if you can see the slides. Um, no visual or sound. We can see you, but not the slides. Why can you not see the slides? Right, upload slides. Open. Right, no visual or sound. Yes, it's just the title screen at the moment. Right, more people are saying that they can see the slides. Um, so I'm going to start. Um, if you can't see the slides, then um, all I can suggest is maybe if you email me after, um, I can send the slides to you. Okay, but more people are saying. So, <clears throat> right, we're going to get going then. So, Ekpat UK. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you have heard of us, but some of you would have been forwarded this and therefore um, uh, people are saying that they can't have sound. Some people must have sound because they've been answering me. Um, so it might be something to do with your computer if you've got no uh, sound. But anyway, I'm going to start anyway because some people must be hearing me, although I'm aware that not everyone can. Okay, Ekpat UK, we're the only charity in the UK that focuses solely on the issue of child trafficking. So uh, we're quite small, but some people are seeing, uh, uh, some. Uh, lots of people don't know us really. So what we do is we have research, even though we are small, we punch way above our weight in terms of research, which um, I'm proud to say. Uh, one of the things that we'll be doing next is um, I'll, I'll be presenting my research, uh, our research, sorry, on Vietnamese trafficking into the UK. Um, we have various different research uh, papers that you can see on our website. Then as well, we do campaigning. We campaign around legislative issues for unaccompanied children seeking asylum, as well as child victims of trafficking. Uh, we provide training. That's the bit that I'm do, I do. Uh, we mostly train local authorities, although we do train other frontline services as well. Um, and then we have a youth program. So if you are a practitioner in, the, uh, in London, then you can refer to our youth program. Uh, any person who's a potential child victim of trafficking between the ages of 15 and 23 can join our groups. So if you want more information on that, then you can email me after. <clears throat> we, uh, the ECPAT network is a network of more than 100 people. 
100 networks, sorry, I'm getting a bit distracted from reading the chat, so that's why. Um, we are in more than 100 uh, different countries. I know it says 90 there, but we just did an audit and we're in more than 100 now. And then we sit on various working groups as well. Okay, so that's us. Me personally, my name's Phil. Uh, I'm a social worker as well. Previously, I worked in child protection and then I worked in youth offending before coming to this job. But as well, I've worked in trafficking charities throughout the UK, uh, throughout in different countries as well. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start on looking at the national referral mechanism. Now, as I've said, some of you will be quite familiar with this and here for really the best practice and you've used it many times before. Some of you it will be completely new. So therefore, I, um, yeah, I'll have to try and pitch to everyone. Okay, so the national referral mechanism is how we refer potential child victims of trafficking. And it's a referral that goes to the central government. Um, it's enshrined in the Modern Slavery Act, which came into uh, law in 2015, but it's been around before then for more than 10 years, I believe, um, and it was previously there in EU conventions. Um, it applies to all forms of trafficking, modern slavery and exploitation, so not just trafficking. However, if you um, have a young person that's involved in forced labour, being exploited, for criminal exploitation or sexual exploitation, it's a broad umbrella, okay? And it is meant to enshrine all of those young people, okay? I'll be focusing on speaking about young people today because that's our focus at ECPAT. However, it is for adults and children, okay? <clears throat> um, it's for all nationalities. So whether the young person is a British national, an EU national, or what's called a third country national, it is for everyone, okay? If you think there's been any cases of uh, any sort of trafficking or exploitation, you can refer to it. And then as well, which is probably lesser known, is that it also involves trafficking, modern slavery and exploitation, which has happened outside of the UK as well as trafficking and exploitation that's happening within the UK. And then it's only first responders that can refer. And we'll just go from them. I'm just gonna, I've been ignoring the comments. I'm just looking. Um, there's a lot of people without sound. Um, however, um, some people must, um, can we just do a little uh, sort of call? Can people still hear me generally? Yeah, okay, so most people are still saying yes, so we're gonna carry on. Great, <clears throat> okay, here's a list of first responders. Um, it's quite a long list, okay. Um, the Home Office and border, border Force, UK Visas and Immigration, all of those departments are first responders. Local authorities are first responders as well. Um, obviously, that is a massive um, cohort of people. So anyone with a local authority um, email address essentially can refer to the NRM. However, we would say that we need to make sure that the best person in the local authority is making that referral. So a housing officer can refer, and in some cases they may be the best person to make that referral. But if they're in a network with a social worker who's probably the lead professional, then in those cases we would probably think that it would be the um, social worker best um, to refer. Um, as you can have a little look at the read, I'm not going to go through them all, but as there's a mix of state agencies as well as um, different charities as well that can respond, uh, can make referrals into the NRM. Okay, I'm going to move on again. <clears throat> so the national referral mechanism, this is how it works. So what we've got here is at the first point, it's a ref you do the referral. Um, this is, as I've said, only first responders can refer. And now it is an online referral and it's sent to the single competent authority. So that's the name of the body that decides whether um, it decides whether a young person or an adult is um, a victim of trafficking. Now, in terms of consent, if you are referring an adult, you do need their consent to go into the NRM. However, for a child, the consent is not needed. 
So even if a child does not consent to it, you can still refer into the NRM, okay? But what we're going to do is, um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit later about that and um, why it might be best to make sure that the child is consenting, okay? Now, once you've made that referral, you get what's called a reasonable grounds decision. And this happens within five days. Theoretically, it should happen within five days. Um, I've just seen a um, question about adults and it's within, a, it's over 18. So an adult is classed as over 18. Anyone under the age of 18 is classed as a child. Okay, keep your questions coming, but I'm going to answer questions at the end, so um, I might not see them if if they're popping up now. Okay, so a reasonable grounds decision. Theoretically, this should happen within five days, and it's a really low legal test. Okay, and what this the test is is I suspect, but I cannot prove. So basically, if there's any suspicion that there is um, trafficking or exploitation happening then um, it means that it should be get a positive, reasonable grounds decision, okay? After the reasonable grounds decision has been made, if it is positive, then you get what's called the reflection and recovery period. This is essentially a, um, a, a period in time where the single competent authority investigates whether the person is um, a victim of trafficking or not. OK, for adults, it has provisions in there, but for children, there's no provisions. OK, and then after what should be 45 days, there's what is called the conclusive grounds decisions uh, decision. And this, again, is a positive or negative. And the legal test of whether a child is considered a victim of trafficking is more likely than not. So that's essentially, a, is it more than a 50% chance that this is a child victim of trafficking? If the answer is yes, then um, it should be a positive grounds decision. Okay. Now, um, something that I'm just going to put into the chat is the new statutory guidance. It was published last week um, and it's not in any of my slides because of this. Um, however, it is there. Um, it's a big document, 167 pages, I believe. Um, but yeah, it's there. Um, it has up to date guidance on the NRM, but as well as numerous different things as well. OK, now <clears throat> what it used to say is that um, it would take a maximum of 40, 45 days for a conclusive grounds decision to be made. Now, those of you who have used the NRM before know that that doesn't happen. Um, and there's huge delays often in the process. Um, now what it says in the statutory guidance that this would be a minimum of 45 days and when the decision's made. Um, so generally what we're still seeing is, is big delays in the national referral mechanism for getting a response. Okay, um, and again, maybe just to put in a bit of context of why we're getting uh, such long um, delays is that the numbers of um, people coming into the national referral mechanism has gone up massively. Um, it's gone up massively since 2016, really. Um, I don't think this is just about awareness, um, but I remember this time as a practitioner and there was sort of this time where we, working in youth offending, you would recognise that young people were um, being exploited, but under our youth justice legislation, they are still considered criminally responsible for their actions. However, under the modern slavery legislation, which is contradictory, um, they are not, um, they're not responsible if they've been, if they've committed offenses um, in the context of their exploitation. So then what you saw around this time is that there was essentially a green light and a go ahead that NRMs could be done for these kind of young people. Um, and I think that's why there's been such a massive rise in the number of referrals to the NRM. And proportionately as well, now 45% of all NRM referrals are for children, whereas 10 years ago, that was a lot less. Um, so the context is really that um, 
the number of referrals going into the NRM has just got so much larger as well, which is potentially um, why there's been such big delays. <clears throat> now, um, I get asked this a lot, or um, I sort of hear this from practitioners a lot, is why should we refer to the NRM? Um, if you work in children's services or you work with children, um, that's a question because there's no direct resource. Um, so therefore, what's the point in it? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the reason why we should, first of all, is the statutory duty to notify. So practitioners, we actually have a um, duty to notify the central government through the NRM when we feel like there is um, potential that a young person has been trafficked or exploited. Excuse me. Um, and then for an adult, even if they don't consent, you still have to notify um, that there's been potential trafficking. And then what you use for that is what's called an MS1 form, a Modern Slavery 1 form. And then, um, yeah, that's how you notify through there. Okay, the second reason why we should refer to the NRM is its implications for legal processes. So for criminal exploitation, um, it's really important if you are looking at using this, uh, the Section 45 statutory defence, um, which I'm going to be doing a, a webinar on next week about, you will certainly need to have an NRM referral if you want to claim the, statute, the Section 45 defence. Um, and it can really have an impact. I know it varies between different courts, but the youth courts that I've seen, um, they are very willing to um, defer to the NRM decisions when making um, decisions around criminal responsibility and withdrawing cases. Um, so if you are worried about a young person being criminally exploited, I'd say that it can really change um, those decisions. Not always, but it can. And then for immigration. Now, for immigration, it's a lot more complicated. If you have a young person um, who is claiming asylum and their basis for international protection is related to the trafficking, then yes, the NRM should definitely be done and it's helpful for it. Okay. However, there have been cases of young people claiming asylum and if their asylum is not uh, based on into um, the trafficking that their claim of international protection is not for trafficking um, but for other reasons then what you see is that as soon as an NRM uh, referral has been made the asylum case is delayed and it's delayed for the outcome of the NRM so you're seeing that some young people who have quite a strong and straightforward asylum claim actually being held up in the asylum system for several years because um, they're waiting on an NRM decision. So in that way, it, it can make things more complicated, okay? Um, the next reason is that it's useful for the prosecution of traffickers. Um, it's not essential for the prosecution of traffickers, which I've also heard as a, a belief that if um, someone is to be tra uh, prosecuted for a trafficking offence, then they need to have um, identified victims with an NRM. That's not true, but it can be useful. And then finally, it can um, guide and justify safeguarding responses. Okay, so we have um, a lot of practitioners here who work in children's services, um, you'll be aware that, <clears throat> pardon me, you'll be aware, <clears throat> sorry, you'll be aware that certain children have narratives around them. There might be a narrative of a young person who is making decisions, um, risk-taking behaviour. Um, if you've got a young person who's been sexually exploited, then um, there might be sort of a narrative around this young person having an older boyfriend and choosing to do these sort of things. What I would say is that as soon as you're referring to the NRM, and then the NRM has come back with positive decisions, then that can really frame a safeguard and response. Instead of a young person being talked about as a naughty child or one making these own decisions with maybe 
a, a worrying older boyfriend. Now this young person is being framed as a child victim of trafficking, and that can really focus the minds of um, children's services and maybe um, people in charge of children's services resources um, to make an effective safeguard and response. Um, so there are certain reasons why we do need to be making those NRM referrals. Okay, um, just very briefly go through the changes in the national referral mechanism that's happened um, over the last couple of years. Um, ECPAT UK published a, a report several years ago and it was about the NRM. The conclusion was that it wasn't particularly fit for purpose. Um, so it has been reformed. Um, the first thing is that it's digitized now. I know in the last couple of weeks there were issues online, so they were taking paper referrals again. Um, however, um, it's now supposed to be totally digitized. Um, I'll put the link up in the following links as well, uh, following slide, so you'll see that. Um, and basically, you'll need a email address with one of those first responders organizations to even get onto the page to make a referral now. Okay. Now, the second change is that now there's one single competent authority. There used to be two. There used to be the UK Human Trafficking Hub, which sat inside the National Crime Agency. And then the other one sat in the Immigration and Visas Department of the Home Office. Now they um, have come together and it is a single um, competent authority that sits within the Home Office. Okay. Um, we, as ECPAT UK, did advocate for the NRM to be more child friendly. Um, we would say that they have, there has been changes, um, but not necessarily changes that we think are more child friendly. Um, but there is certainly more space for narrative assessment for practitioners. Um, now, this could be a good thing and this can be a bad thing. Um, generally, I think this is a good thing. If you remember the old NRM form, it was quite tick boxy. And as a practitioner, you felt like there was very little space to get across what you wanted to say. Um, and the information that we have is important if they're deciding on trafficking cases. Uh, however, <clears throat> now there's a lot more space for narrative assessment. I think that's a good thing if the information and the referrals are um, of the best quality. Um, however, we have seen some really poor um, NRM referrals made by practitioners with barely any information. And this looks to harm a young person's um, NRM case. Okay. Um, so generally it is a good thing, but we need to make sure that we use it properly. Um, and then the last thing is the multi-agency assurance panels, the MAP. Um, this is new. Um, it has a big potential to make a big difference. Uh, I think it's still a little bit too early to try and um, to work out how effective it's been. But basically every single negative conclusive grounds decision now goes through these maps, okay? Um, ECPAT UK are one of the organization that sits on it and we review the decisions made by the single competent authority. And then what the map panel can do is that if they are agreed that the decision um, was not made properly, then they can send it back to the single competent authority with some feedback. OK, so um, we think that's a really good thing that we're able to do. However, um, the map doesn't have any power to make the single competent authority change or even review the um, case. So we can send it back and we can give the feedback, but then the single competent authority has no obligation to actually do anything with um, what the map panels have, have said. Um, and then the other thing as well is that as an organization, we haven't had any feedback on um, what um, has happened with the, the cases that we've sent back as well. OK. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is go through best practice of the NRM. So this is really for practitioners who are first responders 
Um, and this is just a little bit of advice, really, and just making sure that we're doing things right when it comes to NRMs. The first thing is to make sure they are being done. OK, if you have a young person and you're worried about trafficking, modern slavery or exploitation, then make sure you are making these referrals. The second thing is making sure that they're being done in a timely manner. So I'll use an example again of criminal exploitation. If you've got a young person who you're worried about is being criminally exploited, don't wait for them to be arrested, be charged and sent to court before making these referrals. What I would say is that you should be making these referrals as soon as possible, because when that young, if that young person does end up being um, arrested or charged straight away you've got in the police officer's minds and in the cps's mind that this is a young person who's potentially being exploited because even before they were caught there was nrms being done um worried about them being exploited so again it changes the narrative right from the very start um and i think that is what I've seen in the past is that it means that young people who are being exploited are not even getting to the point where they're getting charged and having to be sent to court. So that's a great thing. OK, the next thing is that even if they are charged and sent to court, we need to make sure that NRMs are done early as well. Once a young person puts in their plea, it's very difficult for that charge to be um, taken away. OK, even if it's a not guilty plea, the the not the conviction the offense stays on uh, record okay so absolutely we should be doing it as early as possible once a plea is taken even once if a positive nrm outcome has been made the young person would then need to have to go to um an appeals court if uh, to get a conviction stripped from them okay so it's really really difficult for a young person once they have a conviction to get that taken away from them if there's been criminal exploitation. Okay, I've seen something about credibility issues. I'm going to raise that later as well. Okay, um, so ensure correct and price, precise information. Us as social workers and other practitioners, we do a lot of referrals in our lives, okay? We're used to sort of putting as much information in as possible. We often put in our own analysis of what's happening. Um, and yeah, we do a lot of referrals, so we're often quite used we might, um, to doing them and we might even be doing copy and pasting. OK, what I just say is that we need to be very careful about what information goes into the NRM. OK, it needs to be clear what is factual. OK, and it needs to be very precise information. The reason why is because if an NRM goes in and the um, information is different to say a young person's asylum statement okay if there's conflicting information then it can cause what's called adverse credibility findings and then the young person is not considered um, credible and therefore it can cause not only a refusal on the NRM but it can cause a refusal for their asylum case okay so we've seen that happen in the past and it was done because the person who did the NRM referral, it was quite flippantly done, okay? So, <clears throat> and something else that you might be thinking at this point is, okay, I might have lots of suspicions, but there's nothing I can prove, okay? If you're doing an NRM referral like that, what I'd say is be very clear about what are the facts, and then if you want to put your analysis underneath or what you're worried about, put that, but be very clear that that's speculation. So, for example, if you're um, quite certain and there's quite a lot of evidence for criminal exploitation, put that in. But if you've got some concerns for sexual exploitation, you can also put that in. But be very clear that um, this is sort of something that you're worried about and there's not necessarily a lot of evidence for. Because what we don't want to be doing is we don't want to be putting in um, yeah, and we believe that they are being sexually exploited. And then during the um, reflection and recovery period, it's re investigated and it's quite clear that there is no sexual exploitation that can actually go against the young person in the way that it was the initial referral was unfounded or um, was incorrect. OK, 
So we need to make sure that the information is precise and correct, and that definitely means checking in the interpretation if an interpreter is being used, okay? Similarly, I talked about not uh, children not needing to consent. Children don't need to consent, but they certainly should um, be aware of what's happening and the implications of it as well, okay? They need to know that what they're telling you is going into the NRM, and they need to know that what ha could happen with that NRM information, okay? Again, we've had plenty of cases of young people telling um, practitioners things quite flippantly that going into an NRM and then um, that doesn't sort of um, that doesn't match up with what they've said in a police interview or in an asylum case and therefore once again adverse credibility findings okay so children need to make sure that they know what's going on with these okay the next thing is multi-agency approach. So even though it is a single first responder who makes this referral, the best practice is now is that as a multi-agency network around a child, um, that is how NRM referrals should be done, um, just like in any other safeguarding um, decision-making process. It's done in a multi-agency context. That's to make sure that we have all the information necessary in NRM referrals. And again, it can kind of, it can prevent the, um, the difference in information that can happen, um, that can cause adverse credibility findings as well. Okay. Um, first responders. So even if there's been a negative um, conclusive grounds decision, you can write a reconsideration request. Um, it, you don't just need to be the one who's referred the young person, but it can be any first responder can write a reconsideration request. Uh, the new statutory guidance makes it more clear now of when a reconsideration request can be done. And it is when any new information has come to light, which could have a significant um, difference in the outcome of the case, okay? So if you have any new information, um, you can write a reconsideration request. Um, there's been lots of occasions where police have done recon um, referrals. Um, because the police don't know the child, the referrals can be quite bare. And then later on, the social worker finds out that an NRM has been done and rejected, but the social worker has a lot more information, which is important um, for the case. Um, so in those situations, absolutely reconsideration requests should be done. Okay, the next thing is that there are no right of appeal. Um, you can't appeal this. However, just like with age assessments and age disputes, um, a public law solicitor can take up the decisions in a judicial review. Um, I've been trying not to read the chat because it makes me forget what um, I've been saying. However, I have seen that some people have been talking about this. Um, <clears throat> yes, it, it's not easy to um, get a young person to challenge these, but it is possible. Um, we do have a contact. We were notified about a month ago at ECPAT of a solicitor who is willing to do um, these um, judicial reviews for negative conclusive grounds decisions for children. Um, and it can be done on legal aid as well. So it is possible. And then finally, yeah, okay. I've just seen reconsideration can now be made via solicitor or supporter, not just judicial review. Absolutely, reconsideration requests can be done by other um, other means, but in once there's, you know, if you've done that several times and it's still a negative uh, conclusive grounds decision, then yeah, it can go to judicial review. It Well, it needs to. Okay. So finally, it must be done alongside other safeguarding practices. Um, maybe when a few years ago, even, um, there was this idea that this is a safeguarding tool. Uh, the NRM is not a safeguarding tool. Um, it can, 
yeah, it, it can inform safeguarding decisions, but in, in itself is not a safeguarding tool. So what you'll see now is in all the guidelines, it says in bold writing, um, make sure other safeguarding practices are done alongside um, NRM referrals. When we've done uh, audits before of social work cases where there's been potentially trafficking, um, we've seen that NRMs have been done, but for some reason, unlike in other child protection circumstances, Section 47s haven't been done and strategy meetings haven't been done. So we need to make sure that all those regular safeguarding procedures are happening alongside um, these NRM referrals. Okay, now that's most of what I'm going to say. I'm going to be answering some questions soon. Um, but on the slide here, this is um, how you refer into the NRM. So it's um, modernslavery.gov.uk. Um, and then from there, that's how you do the referral. Um, yeah, so I will try and put that link. Oh, I don't know if I can put that link in the chat. Um, and then also there's the guidance here as well. Um, so this is guidance on filling in the NRM. However, the link that I put in earlier, which is um, this new statutory guidance, is comprehensive over all issues of child victims of traffic or any uh, victims of trafficking, um, and that is also included in there. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our training in a second. Uh, I've really, I haven't actually been seeing what's happening on the chat. The reason why is because every time I read something, it makes me lose my place. Um, and that's why I've been stuttering. So um, I'm going to be taking some questions in a minute and trying to answer them. So if you want to start writing your questions, then um, please do. And I'm going to talk about our training. So. <clears throat> Uh, we offer training, we offer it to individual professionals who want to book on as individuals onto courses. Um, we run our courses in central London in our offices near Covent Garden. Um, all of these courses which are on the slides we run reasonably regularly in normal times um, so anyone can book on them and then but most of our training is done through commission training we come into organizations and we train an entire organization um, when we do that it's based on one of these courses um, however we absolutely do bespoke training um, so we make sure that we tailor it to your local context and your professional context of what's happening there um, if your organization is interested in receiving our training, please get in contact with me. Obviously, our face-to-face -face training isn't happening at the moment. However, if you want to have a conversation about that, then we can absolutely do that now. Um, and even taking bookings um, for later on in the year as well. Okay. So if you're interested in our training, please let us know. Okay. Um, further webinars. So this has been very much a test run. Um, I'm aware that not everyone's had sound and things. Um, I'm going to speak to um, the host, Webinar Ninja, straight after this and try and work out what's going on. Um, and then hopefully the next webinars will be better than this. Um, but I'm going to do one on Thursday. And in that, I'm going to be presenting our research into um, trafficking from Vietnam to the UK. Um, our report's called Precarious Journeys. Uh, it's excellent. It's been really influential around the world. Um, so that's that. I'm going to be talking about that on Thursday. Um, and then next week, I'm going to do one on the Section 45 Statutory Defence. So this is relevant for anyone who's working with children in um, facing criminal charges. And then later on, at some point, I'm also going to be doing other uh, webinars. I'm going to present our research into um, child victims of trafficking going missing from care uh, and that's what our safe accommodation and missing from care training is based on. So that's really excellent research as well um, and I'll also introduce our spiritual abuse and trafficking training at some point as well. Um, as well as those please let me know if there's any other topics around child trafficking, modern slavery, exploitation you'd like these to be on. Um, and I'll do my best to cover them at some point. 